Distinguished guests and speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant morning. Welcome to the third day of the Geographic Information System, or GIS Workshop 101. This event is brought to you by the Urban Design Studio Laboratory of the UP College of Architecture. This is a three-part series of learning events on GIS scheduled last March 10 and 15 and today, March 17. In today's webinar, we will be having an exercise on digitizing building footprints for part one, and part two, we will be exploring the use of map layouts and an exercise using QGIS Layout Composer. Just a short recap of day two of the GIS Workshop 101, held last March 15. The topics that were covered were GIS data sources, formats and inputs, with an exercise on georeferencing, while part two were attribute types with exercise on joining a table to perform a spatial query, vector processing and overlay analysis, and determining flood hazard exposure. Our guest speaker for today, Mr. Miguel Fernandez del Rosario, is a geographer with leadership and operational experience in GIS cartography, geospatial analysis, remote sensing, graphic design, and science research. He is a business development and marketing officer in Geospectrum Marketing Services and the Vice President of Geospectrum Analytics Services. He graduated from the University of the Philippines de Liman with a Bachelor of Science degree in Geography and is currently taking his Master's in Geography in the same university. Let us all welcome Mr. Del Rosario for his presentation. Welcome to the third day of GIS Workshop 101. So for today, um, this exercise will be, uh, rather workshop will be divided into two parts. First, um, we'll digitize building footprints. Uh, we'll also be digitizing uh, lines and points. And for the second part, we'll talk about um, making and uh, laying out uh, maps for publishing. And then we'll do uh, exercises on that. To recap, on the second day, uh, we talked about GIS data sources, formats, and inputs. Uh, we also had an exercise on uh, georeferencing uh, two different types of maps. And then for the second part, uh, we talked about uh, attribute types, uh, joining, and uh, spatial queries, uh, vector processing, and overlay analysis. And we had an exercise to determine flood hazard exposure. So we'll be using the data from those uh, exercise from the previous day, and we'll use that as uh, inputs as well for uh, our exercises today. For the uh, digitizing points and lines, uh, we would need the uh, map of the Typhoon track of Typhoon Ulysses that we georeferenced uh, the previous day. And we would also need the provincial boundary shapefile that we dissolved from our municipal uh, shapefile boundaries and uh, that we also joined with our 2022 uh, population data also from uh, the same day. So for this uh, digitizing exercise, we're, uh, we'll be digitizing the typhoon track lines and track points. Uh, we would need the uh, image that we georeferenced uh, in our previous exercises, so uh, the, the Typhoon track map, and to make sure that uh, we have georeferenced this properly, so while moving the mouse around, we could see that the coordinates at the bottom are changing, and that it uh, corresponds roughly to the coordinates in the grid. Also to make sure we also have the uh, province boundary shapefile that we have joined, or we have joined the 2022 population values with. So we could see the symbology here where 
uh, redder parts uh, have uh, bigger populations. So yeah, we could see that uh, the outline of the Philippines is uh, aligning properly with uh, the georeferenced image. So let's do away with that first. And let's uh, try to add a new shape file. So let's go uh, up here and to add a new shape file layer with this button. So a dialog will pop up. Let's define a new file name for this. So let's say Ulysses uh, track line. And then change the geometry type to a line string. Now don't change any of the other values, just press OK. So we've added the new layer. Of course, there are no new uh, updates to the map since this doesn't have any data yet. We could check by opening its attribute table, and this is still empty. So we could start editing now. So we could right click uh, on this and then toggle editing, or we could also select this layer and click here instead. So next we would see that uh, it's toggled because a lot of the uh, options in the digitizing toolbars are activated or ready to press. And then we could also see the small uh, pencil icon on top of our line. So to make it more visible, the line that we're uh, that will eventually be digitizing. So let's change its symbology to something a little bit more visible. So let's try a line that thick first, and then let's begin digitizing. Uh, so let's uh, add a new line feature. So just press that. And the new icon is popping up. So what we'll be doing is um, selecting as our new vertices the centers of each of these uh, icons that Pagasa is using. So let's start from the initial position here and then end here where it uh, tries to exit the area of responsibility. So I'm just using my uh, left mouse button to click there. And then again, we could use our center, our middle mouse wheel to zoom in and zoom out. And then we could also use the middle mouse button to drag along, to pan along the map. There. Just clicking in the approximate centers. So just clicking, left clicking. And when we think we're done uh, digitizing a particular line, just uh, right click and then this dialog will pop up uh, prompting you to uh, fill in an ID number. So we don't need to fill this up, but I'll just put one here. Press OK. So now we have a line here. So let's just save this and then toggle editing off. So now we have this line layer roughly corresponding to our typhoon trap. So next let's make our uh, typhoon track points. So let's add another shapefile layer. 
So let's just name this the Ulysses track points. And then the geometry type will be point. And now we'll be adding uh, fields since we need to put uh, additional data here. So we'll be adding a cyclone type. So this will just be a text type. And then let's add it to our fields list. And then let's add, add another field, date. And then use the date data type. So add that again as well. And then press OK. So again, we have a new layer. So we'll use this to digitize onto the icons that uh, Pagasa has put here representing the different types of uh, cyclones or Typhoon Ulysses. For now, we'll just uh, put points where there are date labels. So before we start digitizing, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the snapping toolbar. So you could activate that if you don't have uh, yet uh, by right clicking anywhere here and then by activating the snapping toolbar down here. So let's turn that on to enable snapping. Right now I have it set to have a sensitivity of 50 pixels. So let's try that. Let's toggle editing for the track points. And let's add point features. So as we can see here, this is our pointer moving around. And you could see a little pink or purple box indicating that the snapping tool is working. It's snapping to our vertices. So even if we're not uh, very exact with where our mouse pointer is, if we just click here, as long as there's the box, the point will still end up there. So let's add the points. So there's a prompt for each of the points. So unlike the lines, it will prompt every time we click since these are discrete and individual points. So let's set this, the first one as ID number one. And then let's determine the cyclone. So let's refer to the legend. So again, I apologize for the low resolution of this picture, but I'm sure the first point is a tropical depression. And then let's set the date. So this follows the year, month, and day format. So let's type in 2020, November 8th. Press OK. And then let's move on to the next one. So the one here. This is the second one. This is still a tropical depression. now on the 9th of November. Okay. Next point, ID3. I think this is now a tropical storm. Then okay. Then moving on to our fourth point. This is, I think, actually I'm not very sure. So I could turn off the line here. Okay, so I think it is now a typhoon at this point in time.
and then the next point. So still a typhoon. Now the 12th of November. And then uh, the final one. I think this is the sixth point. Still a typhoon. It was uh, temporarily downgraded, but again upgraded just before it left the area of responsibility. Okay. So now that we have these points, we could verify with our attribute table. There. We could uh, save our edits uh, even from within here, from the attribute table, so we don't have to go outside here. So you could just save. And then toggle, turn off editing. And then we could change the symbology of these uh, typhoon track points according to their severity or cyclone type. So let's set the symbology properties to categorized. Then pick the cyclone value. And then just press classify down here. So moving up in uh, severity, I think uh, let's just change the size of the icons. Let's make this three millimeters. So it's a bit, uh, so it's still a bit larger than the track line. For the tropical storm, let's make it six. For the typhoon, let's make it a 10. Let's see if that's okay. There. Let's turn off our georeference map first. And then turn on our province shape file. So there. We could also add labels. So let's go back to the properties of the track points. Go to labels. And then let's pick single labels. And we could just uh, simply choose the values that we would want to be labeled. So uh, it defaulted to just the cyclone field. If we apply that, we could see the uh, descriptions. But what if we want to show both the cyclone type and the date? So we could use the expression builder. So here we could put uh, the fields that we want represented. So usually uh, fields are enclosed in um, double quotation marks. And text is usually just uh, enclosed in single quotation marks. But for now we just uh, want the cyclone type as well as the date. So we could just double click here and it will uh, auto generate. So there's an error here. Uh, we need uh, an operator to make sure that uh, the uh, it is understood properly. So we'll just uh, concatenate the strings here by pressing this one. There, so no more errors. So we could see the preview here. So it clumped up the two values together. So we could add either a space or we, we could add a new line. So in effect, uh, it's like pressing uh, enter or return on your keyboard. So add that one here and add another concatenator. There, no more errors. And we could see the preview here. Press OK. And then try to apply that. So there. So now we have the typhoon track with the typhoon points and we have label, labeled them according to their uh, cyclone types and the dates.
So uh, I thought to include the date fields in the Typhoon track points uh, because there's uh, one function that uh, we could uh, take advantage of with these fields. So we could go to uh, right click uh, the properties of the track points. We could add uh, a temporal uh, control for this layer. So let's turn this on and make sure that uh, the configuration is single field with date and time. The limits are to include the start and to include the end. And specify the field as our date. And then to uh, specify to accumulate features over time. Just press OK. So we'll see the uh, um, clock icon here indicating that uh, temporal navigation is uh, possible with this one. And then there's also the temporal controller panel here. So clicking that um, brings up the, the panel. And then let's choose uh, animated temporal navigation. So the animation range has been set up already here. So from the start of the uh, event up to the end, so up to the uh, 13th. And then the stepping is uh, for every day. So let's try to play that. Starting from the beginning. So yeah, I think uh, it's not completing because um, the time is interfering here. So even though we didn't put any time uh, field or variable, uh, it's assuming that uh, this refers to uh, the midnight of the 8th of November. So let's just uh, make that a zero. Let's try that again. and animating it there much better so we could also add so there's another feature so let's going uh, going to view you could add uh, decorations or map elements to your map so later on in another exercise uh, we'll be talking about uh, making our own map layout in QGIS, uh, we don't usually make our map layouts here in the main map uh, layer. Uh, we do it in the uh, map composer. But we can still add uh, map elements here uh, to help us along. And you can even make uh, quick screenshots with this if you don't want to deal with the map composer yet. So let's add a title label. And then to enable the title label. So I already prepared uh, beforehand. Uh, an expression here which would uh, display the uh, date of the event as the title so I'll just change this uh, to a capital two capital M's so just take note of this code then I'll apply that so there so we have uh, an additional element here so that when we play it again, we could see the uh, title changing to reflect the date. One thing that we could also do well, with this function is to uh, export the animation. So there's a small uh, icon here that we could press. And then uh, we could set up our uh, parameters here. And these will save uh, multiple frames, so individual uh, PNG files, for example, that you could then uh, plug in into your favorite uh, animation tool, like uh, Photoshop, for example. And you could create your own uh, animation like a GIF. So our next task for this is to um, try to make a rough estimation of uh, which places uh, would be most affected by uh, 
uh, this typhoon. So one way to do this would be to try to intersect the path of the typhoon to see which provinces would be affected. Uh, but uh, if uh, we do this, uh, the GIS would only consider uh, the line, for example, and interse uh, intersect only the provinces that uh, would hit that line. But uh, as we know, uh, typhoons have uh, a volume, uh, they're very wide, and uh, they have a very large radius or diameter uh, of area that uh, they could uh, affect at any one time. So we could add a geometric buffer to our line. So searching buffer. So here at vector geometry. So one problem that uh, I'm seeing now is that the option for the distance of our buffer is quantified in uh, degrees. So this is uh, due to the default uh, projection that we are currently using, which is a geographic coordinate system, which measures uh, distance in coordinates or in degrees of uh, latitude and longitude. So we could change that by changing our projection first. So let's close this tool for now. And let's search for the projection. So we could reproject our layer. And then let's pick our track line. And let's change our target reference system. So right now, uh, we're using the WGS84, which is a geographic coordinate system. So we need to change to a projected uh, coordinate system. So for now, let's just follow along and let's look for the a, a common uh, coordinate reference system used in the Philippines. So there's this. Uh, so searching using the keyword 51N, we have um, the WGS84 uh, UTM Zone 51N. So this covers most of the Philippines except for large portions of Palawan and other outlying islands. I think this will be good enough for the purposes of our uh, project right now. So let's just select that and then create a new file. So I'm just going to add a projected here and then to run it there. So nothing has really changed because uh, most uh, GIS software can uh, project or render or display on the fly different kinds of uh, coordinate reference systems. So it can convert it on the go. So we could buffer this uh, projected track line instead. there. So as you can see, when the input layer is uh, this new file, the distance can now be changed to uh, meters. This is because uh, the UTM or the Universal Transverse Mercator uh, projection utilizes uh, the metric system for measuring distance in instead of uh, utilizing the Cartesian coordinates. So let's go to kilometers and let's set up a distance of maybe 300 kilometers. And then let's uh, define the file to save to. So I'm just going to name this the Ulysses track line buffer uh, 300 km so that we know the value. So this is just a very rough assumption. Obviously, 
uh, typhoons uh, are very variable and uh, the, area, the area that they could affect is uh, very variable. So let's just run that there. So this is what the buffer would look like. So let's turn off uh, all of the uh, other layers for now. And then let's make this uh, buffer uh, a, let's convert the symbology to a hash so we could see through it. So by visual inspection, we could already see the uh, amount of provinces that are affected by this uh, theoretical uh, ty typhoon now. So to determine the provinces that were affected, we could run the intersect tool. So here, going to vector overlay intersection. This could also be found here in vector geoprocessing tools. So these are one of the main or commonly used uh, vector operations. So for the input layer, let's set it as our uh, province boundaries and the overlay uh, layer will be our buffer. So let's uh, define our save file again. Let's name it PH Provinces Ulysses. Save and then run it. Close. So now we have a new layer showing the provinces that uh, were intersected by the area of effect of the typhoon. So we could check out the attribute table. So these are our provinces affected. And we could also see the potential uh, population. So this would be the total population potentially affected by the typhoon. But of course, this is a very imprecise measurement, especially as, for example, there are some provinces here uh, that were not completely uh, encompassed. But this is one way where we could uh, take advantage of the overlay uh, vector operations in GIS to determine uh, information like these. So like um, typhoon impact, for example. So for the second exercise, I will be digitizing uh, building footprints. I'll take you through the uh, basic fundamentals of uh, digitizing polygons in QGIS. Uh, for this exercise, I will only need uh, one layer aside from the uh, polygon layer that uh, we'll be generating later in the exercise. Uh, we will just need a base map from where we could uh, which uh, we could use as our reference. So let's use the Google Satellite XYZ tile layer. So this is not uh, added by default in QGIS, unlike the OpenStreetMap one. So um, you could uh, add uh, the XYZ tile um, and then add uh, this URL when adding a new connection. So using this, you can add uh, the Google Satellite layer. Uh, there are also other layers that you could add, uh, like the uh, like the other layers that you would see in your Google Maps application or your Google Earth application. You could add the road uh, roads uh, layer, roads and buildings layers. Uh, add the uh, hybrid uh, layers. So, but for now, we'll uh, use the satellite image layer. So for this exercise, we would need to add a new XYZ tile. So this, uh, so we're adding a new base map. So we just right click on XYZ tiles, add a new connection. 
and then as uh, already listed out in the presentation and in, in the handouts so we'll add the url here you could also search in google uh, just search for add a google satellite xyz tile and uh, this url will come up so let's just name this google satellite and then let's increase the zoom level by one so it's now this now has a maximum zoom level of 19 and let's press ok and then we could add the google satellite layer anytime in any of our projects just by double clicking so here so i've uh, navigated um, to uh, back here in san juan in green hills so depending on your internet connection the speed of the loading of the tiles uh, might be different might be slower might be faster so just exercise some patience and uh, it will eventually load as long as you have the correct url so for this exercise uh, let's now uh, digitize building footprints so instead of uh, lines and points will be digitizing polygons. So let's add a new shapefile layer. Then file name. So I'm just naming mine San Juan Digitized Buildings. And then save. Set the geometry type as a polygon. And then we could set it as a different um, reference system, a different coordinate system. So our project is now defaulting to the uh, geographic WGS uh, 1984 uh, geographic coordinate system. We could change this to the uh, UTM Zone 51 N that we uh, used for the uh, buffered polygon in the previous exercise. This would enable us to, uh, in the end, measure our uh, building footprints in meters instead of just uh, decimal degrees. So this is OK. Let's proceed. Let's change the symbology first of the buildings so that uh, we'll have an easier time uh, once we're digitizing along. Let's make it uh, an outline again. And then we could start editing. So for many buildings, uh, I would recommend that uh, we would be using or adding uh, rectangles instead of just uh, adding polygons to and um, making polygons. So we could uh, try that out first. Uh, this place, uh, Green Hills in uh, San Juan, uh, there are a lot of uh, rectangular buildings or buildings that are near rectangular. So our digitizing would be uh, easier. So we could uh, try to zoom in and then just try to find the foot of each of the buildings. So I'm going to click once first to define the first uh, vertex. So again, uh, we've selected the uh, add rectangle from center and a point. So this is one option. So we could uh, select the center, for example, and then we could uh, make a rectangle like this. And then right click. Then just press OK. But the problem with this is that uh, we have a rectangle that is uh, not uh, oriented properly. So I think uh, we would need another tool. So we could select this option to add a rectangle from three points. 
So you could select your vertices first, like this, and then you would be able to generate a rectangle. So let's delete those first. That's just uh, a trial. So you could even select, for example, and then just select it using the uh, selector tool here, and then delete it uh, by pressing the delete key. So that works as well. So again, um, let's try to estimate the building footprints. So the foot of the uh, for this particular building is around here. So we won't necessarily be uh, using the roof as a guide. So there. So this would be the approximate uh, footprint of the building. So we could keep, uh, just keep doing this. My advice is to use the long part of the building, the longer part of the building, uh, to make uh, the digitizing more accurate. Of course, we could also uh, base the shape of the buildings uh, on the uh, based on their roofs. So uh, we could begin uh, digitizing their roofs. For example, like that. And then just move it. So we'll just use the move feature. Click on it. And then we could move it down back to the footprint. So that's one way. So say we have a building like this. Uh, it's generally rectangular, but there's a scallop here that we have to take into account. So still, uh, we could uh, still make it into a rectangle. Using the roof as a uh, basis. And then we could use the reshape features option. So we could trace the scallop here and then right click, try to do that again. There. And then we could move it back. To help us along, we could set uh, keyboard shortcuts for each of these as I have. So you could access uh, those here in the settings and selecting keyboard shortcuts and looking for the option. So for example, select features. I've assigned it, uh, you, I, I could assign it by selecting here and then for example, typing Alt 1. And then when I type Alt-1 into the keyboard, it immediately uh, changes to this tool. So it depends on uh, your preferences and your most used tools. So another way that... Uh, Another thing that we've observed 
uh, when digitizing these buildings in, in our line of work is that usually uh, it's apparent that uh, these, of course, share uh, a city block, a block of streets. They're usually parallel and perpendicular to these uh, streets to maximize uh, their building footprints. So one way to uh, more easily digitize these uh, buildings en masse is to first uh, digitize the uh, city block where uh, they're located. So we could um, try to make a rectangle again. And then just draw along the whole length of the street. So right about there. And then what we could do uh, using the snapping tool that we have is to make smaller uh, rectangles. So we could reduce the snapping tolerance so it doesn't uh, keep sticking to the other one since it's apparent that um, the buildings are not uh, located next to each other. They're not, st uh, they're not stuck to each other. And we could also change uh, where we're snapping to. So we could also uh, snap to the segments. So let's try that. So there, it's also snapping to the segments rather than just the vertices. So a trick that, uh, or something to, uh, to keep in mind when uh, using this technique is to stick to, for your first two vertices of the rectangle, you should stick to the lines. You shouldn't cross, you shouldn't cross uh, across to the to another line since uh, this could affect the angle of your rectangle if you stick to uh, just one of the lines first for your first two vertices for example like this you could extend this to the next uh, to the other side of the rectangle the rectangle guide that you just made and it would be perfectly parallel to this one. So we, we could just uh, keep doing this. Oops. So I think I might have uh, missed that one. So make sure we're snapped. To the segment So uh, I think that will do for now. Let's just select our guide. Uh, we could remove our guide rectangle now. And then we could uh, move uh, these as we see fit and edit them if we think that the size is incorrect. So let's use our move tool and move them back to their uh, bases.
So this one, this one is obviously smaller than our, our rectang uh, rectangle suggests. So we could use the reshape tool like this. And then right click there. Then we could also trim this side. Oops. There. So we could just keep repeating this. We could keep making uh, guide rectangles to help us create uh, component rectangles. So those are just the uh, very basic uh, digitizing tools, uh, as I'm sure uh, you, are, you might be aware of, especially for those with experience in using um, CAD software. Uh, there are also options and uh, tools and features in QGIS and other uh, GIS software where you could do what is called uh, absolute uh, editing or absolute or relative uh, digitization where um, like in uh, other CAD software, you could just uh, input the origin, the length, uh, and the um direction or the heading of the uh, lines where you could make the polygons so you could uh, do those same things as well uh, in uh, gis software so that you could uh, be even more precise especially if you have the um, data uh, indicating the for example the coordinates the origins the headings and the uh, the lengths of each of the uh, component segments. Like for example, if you have land titles or technical descriptions, you could also apply that uh, in your uh, when you're digitizing in GIS software. So this is the end of part one. Thank you very much, Mr. Del Rosario, for part one of today's workshop and for the step-by-step -step guide on digitizing building footprints on GIS. For now, we shall take a five-minute break for you to relax and take in the lessons and information we have learned for part one of the workshop. For those who have questions on Mr. Del Rosario's lecture, please send them through the link shown on the screen. This is also the same link to the feedback form, which you can fill out, and in order to receive a certificate of attendance, for day three of the GIS Workshop 101.
The second part of the program is a continuation of Mr. Del Rosario's presentation, which now focuses on the use of map layouts and an exercise on using QGIS Layout Composer. Let us welcome again Mr. Del Rosario for part two of today's workshop. So let's uh, discuss a little bit uh about uh, maps and what they look like uh, before we proceed uh, with uh, making our own. So maps usually have um, certain elements aside from just the main data or the main um, map uh, map view. So we have uh, in our map display, we can have the neat line, we have the grids and graticules, uh, we have legends and their corresponding symbologies, uh, scale bars and north arrows, uh, titles and uh, accompanying text and uh, inset maps. So not all maps need to have uh, these elements. Uh, some maps uh, need more uh, elements than others. So it doesn't really mean that uh, there should be a, a certain kind of map. So as long as we're not uh, misleading our uh, audience and our end users. So I think uh, there's a, a lot of uh, latitude, uh, shall we say, uh, about uh, making our own uh, styles of maps with, it, uh, with its own uh, map elements. So um, we have here a, an official map from Namria of Quezon City. So this is uh, what they call a topographical map. And uh, they have a lot of the standard uh, map elements that uh, we could use for our own maps. So first at the top, so they elected to put uh, the name or the title of their map here at the top with their logo and uh, a little bit of uh, context for the uh, location. So Quezon City is located in the National Capital Region. And uh, to the right, they also have um, they also have the number scale and uh, our grid reference. Since uh, Namria makes a lot of maps, uh, it's important that they have a grid reference system so that uh, they could quickly search for a particular map. And for the scale, uh, for this part, they also included a scale number, so not just a scale bar. So this map is really meant to be printed in just uh, one particular size. You can't put uh, scale numbers in a map that could be printed in different uh, dimensions of dimensions of paper or or JPEG files, for example. So next, uh, we have our map view where we have uh, all of our uh, map details and data. To the side of the map view, uh, we have the neat lines that form the frame of the map or the extent of the map data for this particular map. And then we also have the uh, coordinate grids. So here we have uh, interior tick marks. And then the uh, coordinates are also stated in uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds. So for the bottom left, um, there's also some uh, regular, regulatory or um, text that uh, would credit um, all of the contributors of the map. So it's saying um, the latest edition of the map or the date of publishing for this map. And then the sources of information that they used to generate the map. And uh, all other uh, legalese. And then we have the legend which explains uh, all of the different types of uh, symbologies that uh, they have used to uh, represent the different kinds of data that they have on the map. So uh, they have uh, roads, uh, types of land use, and even elevation. And then we have the scale bar. Again, we have the scale number. So this is really just meant for a specific uh, dimension of uh, paper to be printed on. And then there's also an explanation for the contour intervals for the elevation contours and the main map view. And the 
uh, projection that they have used so that uh, for example if you're still working on paper maps uh, you could uh, accurately um, know um, the kind of uh, coordinate system that they're using and they also have an inset map so this one is uh, a grid reference so again they're referring to the grid reference uh, numbers or index that they have and relating it to other nearby uh, grids and also a bit of a visualization of the vicinity of the area so you could see uh, Laguna de Bay, uh, Manila Bay so that you could uh, orient yourselves if you're not uh, very familiar with um, the area so before we start uh, with the uh, exercise proper, let's make sure that we have all, all the data that we need uh, loaded into our uh, QGIS project. So first, uh, we'll need again the municipal boundaries that we uh, edited so that uh, we could have uh, just one uh, city of Manila instead of just the multiple uh, sub-districts of Manila so that it would look better in the uh, symbology or in the map layout. Uh, we'll also need the clipped uh, OpenStreetMap buildings of San Juan. So we did this uh, in the previous uh, day of the workshop. And then we'll also need the uh, roads from OpenStreetMap. So we downloaded that in uh, day one. So it should be in the same uh, folder as uh, your other OpenStreetMap data. And then we'll also need the uh, clipped uh, five-year flood hazard shape file of San Juan. So we also did that uh, in our uh, previous day of the workshop. So let's start where we left off uh, yesterday uh, in San Juan. So firstly, I have loaded in this particular QGIS project the municipal boundaries. So we're here back again in the city of San Juan. I have also loaded the five-year flood hazard shapefile that we clipped. So this is now clipped uh, just for the city of San Juan. And then we also have the clipped uh, OpenStreetMap uh, buildings for the same city. There's just one more th uh, thing we need to have loaded. So I have uh, also loaded the uh, roads from uh, OSM. So it um, might take a while to load on your system. So uh, let's uh, try to help it by clipping these roads to the city boundaries as well. So first I'll select the city and then run the clip tool. So our input layer will be the roads. And then for the overlay layer, the one that uh, we'll be using to clip will be the municipal boundaries and make sure to have this option selected so that we'll only clip using the selected features, which in this case is uh, the city. So let's specify our uh, output. So I'll just name it uh, San Juan OSM Roads. Make sure it's uh, sh uh, saved as a shapefile. And then click Save. And then Run. So there. So we already have a clipped version of the roads from OpenStreetMap just for the city of San Juan. We could try to change the symbology to make it a little bit clearer. Let's make it black. See if that helps. Yes. Okay. 
So again, let's take a look at the layers that we have right now. So we have the flood hazard and we also have the buildings. So let's go back to the flood hazard and see if we could make it a little bit more uh, clear. Right now, there are uh, black borders between the polygons for the different kinds of flood hazard. So we can also change that. So what we'll do, so we already have a symbology here. Um, so it's a categorized symbology and uh, we've already set the colors in uh, our previous session. So we had the low, moderate, and high symbologies. But each of these still have the black outline or black border. So we could uh, change these one by one. Or we could select all of these and then right click here at the symbol. And then we could configure the symbol. And then go to simple fill. And then change the stroke style to no pen. So as we can see, it changed the properties of the stroke or the outline. So if you click OK, that should apply to all of these three values. And we, if we uh, click apply again, so there. No more outlines. So depending on your application, uh, it might be better to uh, render it this way. So I forgot to deselect the city of San Juan. So we could remove the yellow color from the whole city. There. So before we proceed with the uh, map layout uh, composer uh, exercise, uh, let's try to visualize, visualize first in our main uh, map viewer how our data would look like in the map before we add all of the other map layers. So I think we should put the roads on top of the flood hazards. And then let's take a look at the buildings as well. So I think uh, with this uh, outline for the buildings, it m still might be a bit too cluttered. So we could try to reduce the stroke width of the building footprints. So I'm trying uh, 0.3 millimeters. Let's try to make it thinner again, 0.2. There. Maybe that would work. So let's use that for now. So I think we have uh, all of the uh, map layers that we need for this particular map. So now let's head out into the map composer. So it's found here at the top, the menu bar, the menu toolbar, click project, project rather. And then here are the options for the print layouts. So we could just click here for a new print layout. And then set up a name for the print layout. So I'll just name this uh, Sun One Five Year Flood Hazard. Map. Press OK. So this will pop up a new uh, window for the Map Composer. So we could just save this and then exit it again, and then it'll be found here in the Layouts dialog or here in the layout manager so you could do other things here in the manager like duplicate it or remove it or rename it or we could just show it again so the advantage of this kind of interface is that you could um, lay out your map while also still uh, using the main QGIS uh, map uh, mapping functions or GIS functions. So if, if you need to change something about uh, the layers that you have here, you could change it again and have it reflect on the map that you are making. On the flip side, 
could also save the state of your current map and you could uh, make further changes here in your main map without affecting your map layout so it could go both ways so here we are at the map composer so let's check out the different uh, toolbars and panels that we have here so we have another uh, menu bar and then we have the toolbar for the main functions so we have save new layout duplicate layout layout manager add items from template save as template add pages print layout export as image svg or pdf we also have the zoom controls so you could zoom your entire map layout and then other lay, uh, layouting functions uh, similar to what you might see for example in photoshop then we also have another toolbar here for adding the map elements so we could just go through all of those as we go along so first let's add a new map by clicking this one and then just dragging along over this map display. So as you see, it has rendered the map that we are currently using in the main map layout. We could also check the dimensions of this uh, map page. So checking out the printer page uh, setup, for example. Then right now it's at letter. We could change it to A4, for example. Then also changing it to here. In the layout variables. So right now it's at uh, 210 by 297 millimeters at 300 dots per inch. So you might be wondering for this um, map that we just added, how can we make this um, perfectly uh, conform to the size of our page? So let's go to the item properties for this particular map item. So we could see the different options. So we have the scale here, the map rotation, the projection or reference system that uh, this map is currently using and the extents of the map so this is uh, more of the bounds or the extents of the latitude and longitude so basically this map covers uh, all of these bounds then we also have position and size So let's take note again of the map uh, of the map print size that we have. Let's go back to layout. So we have 210 by 297 millimeters. So we could add a, a 5 millimeter buffer for each of the sides. So that would mean we would subtract 10 from our uh, page page dimensions so you could input 200 by 287 and then set up its anchor point so this is the uh, origin of the map dimensions so we set the reference point to the upper left so this is the upper left of the particular map that we added here and then let's set it as five millimeters in both x and y so there's a distance of five millimeters in the x and y coordinates in relation to the entire map page So one thing that I've noticed is that um, 
our map view of the city might not be might, might not be perfectly centered. So we could change that in multiple ways. So we could change it using the scale. So this will affect the zoom level of the map. So for example, if we set it to 14,000, so that can zoom out the map. What we could also do is rely on these other uh, options here. So we could set map extent to match the main canvas extent. So for example, we could go back to our main window and then right click uh, our OSM buildings layer and then zoom to the entirety of this layer. So there, so there's a bit of a gap. So it's centered in the map view and then going back into the map composer, we could just click here again, set to set the map extent to match the main canvas extent there. So it's centered here. So take note, sometimes, uh, depending on the map that you're making, uh, conventions might uh, force you to revert to a scale that is a uh, rounded up uh, on a particular uh, place. So for example, um, it might require you to round up to the nearest uh, thousands or ten thousands. Since you might be adding a map element where you're putting the uh, exact scale and uh, your end users might need to replicate this map uh, by hand and they might want to use a uh, scale that is uh, easy to use instead of uh, a more arbitrary number. So for now, we'll stick with this scale so that we can strike a balance between showing the entirety of our project area or our area of interest. And the spacing between the sides. So for this map, I've decided to just uh, maximize um, this whole map for the entirety of the page. So what you can do sometimes is you could change the dimensions here and we could put our other map elements here for a neater layout. Uh, but I think for this particular example, for example, for the city of San Juan, there might be enough space for the map elements uh, all around here. So let's start looking at the map elements that we could add to this. So we could add the legend first, and then drag it here. We could update the layers that are being shown in this legend. So I'll uncheck auto update so that we could uh, edit it manually and then remove the layers that we don't need. Then we could also rename it by double clicking. Let's just name this building and this one roads. This one is flood hazard with the parenthetical five year rain return period. This one, we could rename it to Municipal Boundaries. There. So we could mess around with the different uh, text formatting, for example. We could also put multiple columns. So if you want to change the layout of this, 
and if you also want to add the frame. There. So there's a frame now. Let's add that title. Let's add the title. Legend. So let's give it a consistent buffer. So using the bottom right uh, reference point, we could make it uh, exactly 10 millimeters from the side of the paper. So 287 and 200 there. And then save it. As you can see, that's reflected here in our item legend or item layers. And we could change the ordering of the layers. Right now, we don't need to do that. But let's, get, uh, let's go back to map one. We could rename it to the main map as we might be adding another kind of map later. So one other thing we could add to this main map the grid. So going to the item properties, grids, add a new grid, and then let's modify this grid. So we'll set the settings of this um, map grid. Let's try a very small number for now. So that might be too much. Let's try that one. So this might be better. So these values are represent for this particular map uh, 0 0.01 of a degree of latitude or longitude. So we could change uh, all of the other uh, settings for this. So we could draw the coordinates, for example, on the side of the map. So we could see it here. Uh, being drawn. We could change the format. We could change it to degrees and minutes instead of just decimal degrees. And then for the left and the right uh, side coordinates, we could change their orientation. So for the left side, we could have it as uh, vertical ascending and for right we could have it as vertical descending there and we could reduce the co coordinate precision so that we only have the degrees and the minutes without any decimals as we don't need that for now So as you might see, this might be a bit too busy, the grids. So we could change the line style. Go to simple line. And then change the stroke style to no pen. And then just add a frame. Because right now we don't have a neat line for our map. So going back to the grids, change the frame style to inferior ticks. So now we have we have the inferior ticks for this map. And then let's also add a 
frame for this. As I'm not seeing any lines yet. So let's just go to frame. There. So we now have a e frame or a neat line around our map. Next, let's add a scale. Let's add a scale bar. So here are the item properties for this. We could change the units of the scale bar. Change it to 500 meters. So that we could have a scale bar that looks like this. So it's 500 units, so that's 500 meters, multiplied by two right segments, two positive segments. We could add a background, a white background, and a frame for this. There. And then fix the position. Next, we can add a north arrow, drag it, so there are many different kinds of arrows that we could use, for example this one, this is a letter N on it, so that might be useful, I'll just position it here. Then we could also add a frame and background. But we can't see the end anymore, so let's change the background color to an off white or a light gray. There. So the next thing that we could add is an inset map. So let's do that now. So let's add another map here by clicking this. And then just dragging along. Wait for it to render. And as you might see, it has also rendered the same kind of map. Because this is still based on what we have here in our main window. So first, let's go back to the main map and then make sure to lock so that it won't change even if we change uh, any of these. So we could turn, uh, turn all of this off and click update map preview and it, it wouldn't change anything since we have locked all of the styles. But if we do that for this one, for our map 2, so we could rename it the inset map. If we update that again, the map would disappear since we turned off all of our layers in the main map window without locking our layers for this particular item. So let's go back to our main window and pick a suitable zoom level for an inset map that might be useful for uh, other users who might not might not be familiar 
of the exact location of the city of San Juan in Metro Manila. So we could do this. Just zoom out. And go back to the map. And then refresh it again. And then click set map extent to match main canvas extent. So yeah, there. It will zoom out again. But I think the problem here is that uh, it might not be too tidy as there are too many uh, map labels uh, fighting with each other. So we could change the symbology again. Go to the properties in the main map window. And then go back to labels and let's make the text smaller. Let's try half the size and apply. Let's check out the map layout again and then refresh it. There, that, that might be better, but still a bit too crowded. So let's adjust it again. Let's make the stroke width of the municipal boundaries even uh, smaller. And then make the label text even smaller. Let's try three. And then a much thinner text buffer. Let's see that again in our map layout. Let's zoom in, see if the text still makes sense. So yeah, I think that's okay for now. Then let's just change, uh, let's also lock the layers for these. And then let's see if we could add a background to simulate the color of the sea. There. Let's make it a little uh, less saturated. There. And add a frame. Next, we'll add an overview, which shows us the extent of our map. So we've added a new overview for the inset map. And then let's specify it to overview on the main map, map frame. And as you can see, there is a small rectangle here. So this might be a bit too small, might be too uh, invisible. So let's go back to our, let's try to change the zoom level or the scale. Make it a bit uh, more zoomed in. Let's try 100,000. Okay, maybe that's a bit too zoomed in. Maybe 500,000. We could also interactively edit the map extent. There. We could move it around. Then let's change the frame style to make it a bit more visible. How about a red outline? Okay, I think that's better. And then to finish it off, let's add a title.
adding a frame and a background again. Let's add a bit of uh, vertical and horizontal margin so that it's not sticking into the border. There. And resize it again. And then change the position, fine tune it. Same as for the inset map. There. Then let's save it. And then we could export it as an image. And then click Save. And then we'll specify our export parameters. And then click Save again. So wait for that to export. And then let's check out how it looks like. There. So we now have an image of our final map layout. So that's it for now. Uh, I hope you are now all just a little bit more familiar with QGIS and GIS in general. We've gone through the basics of the interface, georeferencing maps, uh, performing vector searching, selecting and overlay analysis operations, uh, digitizing, and finally uh, laying out a map. I hope this wasn't too hectic as these are some important topics and lessons that normally span an entire semester's worth of introduction to GIS. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Del Rosario, for your comprehensive and step-by-step -step instructions with regards to the use of GIS. Again, for those who have questions on Mr. Del Rosario's lecture, please send them through the link shown on the screen. This is also the same link to the feedback form, which you can fill out in order to receive a certificate of attendance for day three of the GIS Workshop 101. And to formally close our event on GIS Workshop 101, held last March 10, 15, and today, March 17, 2022, we would like to welcome Professor Anna Katrina Karaan, who is part of the organizing team who spearheaded this event, to give us the closing remarks. Good morning. And to all of you joining us today and last March 10 and 15, thank you for your time and interest. Through these three sessions on the basics of GIS and a QGIS application, I hope you have received a better understanding and appreciation of geographic information systems as a tool for creating more responsive plans and designs. Our two speakers, Dr. Maliari and Mr. Del Rosario, have given us a good background on why and how we could use GIS so that we may begin exploring this in our own fields. Echoing what Professor Rochelle Reyes Barria said during her welcome remarks, we at the Urban Design Studio Lab believe that integrating these technologies in our research and teaching is essential in supporting the creation of sustainable, climate and disaster resilient cities and urban areas. On this note, we intend to continue hosting more learning sessions on GIS in the future, with specific topic focus, such as GIS for land use, for transport, 
and for site development, among others. Through this, we hope to encourage its use among building professionals. So to our students and to all our participants, please take what you've learned and begin using this in your design and planning processes and see how your projects can be enriched through the analysis and visualization stemming from the use of GIS. Before we officially close the session, we would like to give our utmost thanks to our two speakers. We present these certificates of appreciation to Dr. Alyosha Ezra C. Malyari for having shared his valuable knowledge and expertise as research speaker during day one of the GIS Workshop 101 held online on March 10, 2022. And to Mr. Miguel Fernandez del Rosario for having shared his valuable knowledge and expertise as resource speaker on day one, two, and three of the GIS Workshop 101 held online on March 10, 15, and 17, 2022. We would also like to give special thanks to the Dean of the UP College of Architecture, Dr. Grace Ramos, for her constant support and encouragement. To the ARC 162 classes taught by Prof. Kelvin de Chavez, Prof. Rachel Reyes Barria, and myself, thank you for joining us and following the activities of this workshop. And finally, to the extension team, Professor Aaron Lechones, Pura Beatriz Valle, and Vicky Arnaiz, thank you so much for your invaluable support in organizing the webinar. We hope to see you in May for our Studio Lab's next webinar, continuing on with the theme of climate action. In the meantime, we look forward to your feedback and any ideas for collaboration on how to design for better urban areas. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Professor Anna Karaan, for presenting the certificates to our honored speakers and for that wonderful message in emphasizing the importance of the use of GIS and its relevance for the use in urban design. And to everyone, thank you very much for joining us for Day 3 of GIS Workshop 101. We hope that these sessions have been helpful to your introduction in learning about geographic information systems and we hope to see you again in our upcoming webinars. We thank you for your active participation, and we hope that we will see you again for more lectures. Have a great day ahead.